Happy New Year, fellow cultists. This is DML, and uh, we are back with another Shadow of the Demon Lord talk. This is episode number 67, and we're kicking off 2022 with a talk about uh, the meta campaign. Um, so what the hell is a meta campaign? I talked about it in some of my previous videos, but I wanted to do a little bit deeper dive on what that means for me anyway. And um, what it, uh, you know, how you could go about uh, running a meta campaign as well, if you so wish to do so. Now, what whole what prompted this whole uh, meta campaign idea was the fact that I got this wonderful book and via Kickstarter, and I got about uh, seventeen thousand uh, supplements to go with it. Maybe not that many, but it seems like that many. And um, it just had a, a ton of information, a ton of lore, a ton of world building, and it was just a, 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 a very rich um, setting for this game that was presented with all the material and has subsequently been supported by more uh, supplements, uh, building the world up even more. And... This is a, a, a this is a fantastic <clears throat> campaign world that has lots of depth and uh, lots of places to adventure. But here's the thing: um, the whole game is built upon the premise that the world is going to come to an end, and so each adventure that you run could potentially end the world. And so, <clears throat> um, that's great and all. Um, you know, your heroes are supposed to try to stop it, and hopefully they will stop it. But, um, you know, what if the world ends in, like, the first episode, in, in the first campaign? In fact, the, t the very first campaign that was ever produced for this, uh, for this game tells the Demon Lord. Uh, let, me, let me grab this sucker out here. So, Tales of the Demon Lord was the first campaign that was produced for... Uh, this game, and it came out several years ago, and here it is, ah. and it was, <clears throat> um, it was built in the same vein as the game presented itself as a world on the verge of an apocalypse, and um, if you, and spoilers in case nobody has gone through Tales of the Demon Lord, even though it's been out for 750 years. Um, this uh, this is going to get into spoilery, spoilery territory. So back the fuck out right now if uh, you don't want to be spoiled. Okay, so having gotten that disclaimer out of the damn way, um, the uh, the very last adventure in this campaign... And has the very final scene that states, this final scene occurs only if the characters fail to recover the Eye of the Demon Lord from the Brotherhood of Shadows. At midnight on the third day, the following events occur, proceeding uh, until the characters kill uh, Catendramas, or until you reach the final event. <clears throat> so at 12 a.m., a deafening noise sounds out above crossings, shattering all glass within the city, and a character... Let's get a blah, blah, blah. Okay, 1206. The six fairy spires across the city emit a white height light, light that turned night to day. Um, 1212. Each blazing spire loses a ribbon of light that drifts towards a point in the sky 600 yards above the city. When the ribbons meet, they form an undulating mass of vibrant color. Uh, 1218 a.m. A blot of darkness appears in the center of the colorful mass, heralding the arrival of the void. <clears throat> 1224. From out of the widening darkness, 1d6 tiny demons with a flyer trait descend on crossings and attack any creatures they encounter. And eh, no big deal, right? 1d6 tiny demons. 1230 a.m. The following, following the first demons, 2d6 small demons with the flyer trait join the assault. Okay, that's more of a problem. 12.36 a.m., a group of 3d6 medium demons with the flyer trade emerge from the void. 
that's even more problematic, at 12.42 a.m., a group of 3D6 large demons with a flyer tray come forth. Uh, now we've got a city full of demons, and we're not done. 12.48 and 12.54 a.m., another 3D6 tiny demons, small demons, medium demons, or large demons, all with a flyer tray join the others. And then 1 a.m., the demon lord emerges from the void and begins to devour the world, the end. What? The end? This is the first campaign for this new game I just bought. And just because my players suck, um, now I have to start a whole new campaign world? Okay, so anyway, that's, that's what could potentially happen. So, how do we avoid this? Well, you can't necessarily. They could, you know, they, your players could suck, and you could destroy the world in the very first um, campaign. But assuming that you have enough uh, DM wherewithal to uh, guide your players far enough along the campaign to help them uh, meet the goal of defeating the Brotherhood of Shadow and prevent the end of the world, then you can continue the campaign. So you've got one campaign under your belt. The Brotherhood of Shadows tried to bring the Demon Lord into the world. They failed because your heroes stopped them. So now what happens? Well, you start another campaign, right? And that's what I did. I started a second campaign. And my second campaign was called The Mother of Monsters. And at this point, I wanted to introduce something of my own into the campaign world because I thought there was something missing and that something was uh, kaiju-sized monsters. So I introduced the uh, Mother of Monsters into the campaign. And, and the Mother of Monsters is a bit of lore that is in the, uh, the game itself. I might do a uh, villain's... Uh, video on her, but the, the uh, Mother of Monsters basically births monsters. And so my idea was that the Mother of Monsters uh, was responsible for the downfall of the Isle or the, um, the Land of Is, uh, from which the, uh, um, the wizards of the Tower of King come. And so um, the Mother of Monsters managed to escape Is, uh, came to rule, and started spawning all these, gar what I'm calling gargantua. That's my word, that's my Shadow the Demon Lord word for uh, kaiju. So that was my second campaign. And so that introduced another aspect into the campaign. Now, my players managed to um, defeat the Mother of Monsters. They buried her, basically, uh, with a nuke. Um, don't ask. And... Um, so they might have killed her, they might not have killed her, but they stopped the immediate problem, her spawning these kaiju. And so all the kaiju that she had spawned, which were a few, um, being cut off from the mother, basically went to sleep. So they're dormant now, and but they're still in the campaign world for me to play with later on. So that was campaign number two. And... Basically, from campaign one to campaign two, I'm also trying to perpetuate the shadow event that started in the Tales of the Demon Lord, which is the fall of, the civil, fall of civilization, which is where the orc um, advisor to the human emperor uh, killed the human emperor and took the alabaster throne, um, becoming Drudge the uh, first emperor, orc emperor of the empire. And so I, throughout the second campaign, I had, well, throughout the first campaign, actually, uh, Tales of the Demon Lord, I had tensions rising. I had um, bands of orcs that were threatening uh, the various settlements in the Northern Reach. Um, and so uh, that was a theme in the first campaign, and I've continued that in the second campaign. In the third campaign, <clears throat> which I finished earlier this year, uh, Dreams of the Dead God, um, I, you know, with, with this particular one, and, and let me, let me just read a bit on the uh, Dreams of the Dead God so you have an understanding of what 
um, impact this had on the world. So the um, uh, this shadow event, um, the shadow event basically had a um, and a very powerful godlike being starting to aw- awaken from a slumber that was imposed upon him in, early in the world's creation. That part was not defined by me in the campaign that I ran. Um, but basically, it is either a very powerful genie or just some elder god uh, type entity from the void that you know made its way into uh, the world while it was being created and was imprisoned and put to sleep. So the god has begun awakening and in the process of awakening, uh, it aims to remake the world. So it was... Uh, slowly starting to cause physical changes through its um, through its power uh, the, through the, uh, the the dreams of the mortals that it was drawn power from, and it was causing physical changes in the world. So it was it was causing um, uh, at first just minor things, but then later as it became more and more um, alert and awakened, um, you know, chunks of earth would be rising up. Uh, out of the uh, off the world and starting to float and uh, you know a variety of different weird things began to happen throughout the world and so this has also resulted in some physical changes in the landscape of um, the campaign world now all these things are slowly changing the world and moving it towards that um eventuality where the demon lord is actually going to um, destroy the world because that is almost inevitable um and i say almost because i have a plan so the um the whole point of the meta campaign is to keep the story going and to keep the um the world getting more damaged and more impacted by these various shadow events. So each campaign that I have started has had an associated shadow event um, with the uh, the campaign that it has some kind of impact in the world. Oh, I forgot to mention in the Dream of the Dead God, I also had rising um, uh, tensions rising between the uh, the empire and the, um, the Holy kingdom. And so, um, basically drudge had ordered, uh, his armies to start amassing at the borders of the, uh, of the Holy kingdom with intent to, uh, invade and the Holy kingdom responding and calling out to, excuse me, just had chili. So pardon the burp. Um, but anyway, the uh, the Holy Kingdom has called out for help, um, and you know all the other uh, surrounding nations are you know forced to choose a side. Do they side with the or the new orc emperor, or do they side with the Holy Kingdom? And so um, that is one of the tensions that I brought up in the third campaign, <clears throat> and that's as far as I've gotten so far. Um, unfortunately, uh, my gaming group likes to play other games besides Shadow the Demon Lord, and I like to try different things out myself. So uh, in between these campaigns, we've been playing other stuff. Um, but I do have a plan for uh, several other campaigns that will eventually lead to the, um, the fall of Earth. And so this is my outline. Now, this is not set in stone. I can reorder these. I can change them. Um, I am not um, painting myself into a corner with any of this. This is just a, an outline for me to keep me motivated into, into the um, progression that I've started with the first three campaigns. So the next campaign I plan on running, potentially, is the Queen of Gold. Now, the Queen of Gold is uh, the, another campaign. Excuse me. Okay. Um, Yeah, I've got um, 
allergy issues going here. So sorry if I grossed you out. But here is um, the second campaign. This is Queen of Gold. And the Queen of Gold is, um, for me, a great way of taking the player characters off of the main continent and having them do this campaign in the Pirate Isles and basically off in the ocean. And um, allowing me to rise, uh, raise the stakes and the hostilities between the Empire and the other nations. So while the characters are going to be adventuring in the Queen of Gold, uh, war is going to break out on rule and between the Holy Kingdom and the Empire. And, um, you know, shit's going to go down and um, it's going to drive the... Um, uh, the future of the campaign, whether the Empire survives, uh, whether the Holy Kingdom takes over, uh, or whether something else happens is, you know, going to be up in the air. I haven't really decided on how that's going to go. So that is my plan for the next campaign. Now, I may actually push that out further. I haven't decided yet um, uh, because I'm not sure if I want to take that step just quite yet, but that that is kind of the plan at, at this point in time. Now, another campaign I want to run is what I'm referring to as uh, Tales of the Demon Lord 2. Now, the re reason I'm referring to it as that is because I want to um, I want to set it up uh, basically similar to the Tales of the Demon Lord in which it had a bunch of uh, adventurers, some of which progressed a plot, others of which were kind of like Monster of the Week um, standalone episodes. Um, so I want to do another... I like that format uh, because it helps me... <clears throat> it helps me to, um, to throw in different adventures that really don't have anything to do directly with the main storyline of the campaign, but enables me to have still have several adventures in the, uh, in the campaign that progress the main plot. Um, so I want to do a, a Tales of the Demon Lord 2. Uh, oh, let me back up. So uh, with Queen, Queen of Gold, it, it starts off with the Infectious Madness. Um, shadow Event. Now, the problem with Infectious Madness is it doesn't really explain why. Why is that the Shadow Event? Um, it, it, and it, I, Unless I haven't read this um, clearly enough, um, it doesn't really give a good answer. Uh, the whole plot of the Queen of Gold is that there's a necromancer that's possessed by a demon, and um, the uh, necromancer wants his golden statue back that was stolen by a pirate. And so this demon-powered necromancer uh, basically raises an army of undead uh, to fall upon the pirate isles and uh, reclaim his, uh, his lost uh, statue, which is, um, he calls it his bride or his queen, um, but it, it's like a sentient statue. Um, but it doesn't really state why the Infectious Madness is the shadow for this campaign. It's almost like um, Robert Schwab just kind of picked one and just said, ah, we're going to go with this one. Um, so I decided we, we really need something more uh, to really explain the infectious madness. Why, why, is, uh, why is madness spreading? And so I kind of I thought this through and I thought, well, maybe I can piggyback off of my last campaign and also tack on another shadow event that kind of ties them together. And so the Dreams of the Dead God was a, an elder being starting to awaken, and it was impacting the dreams of the mortals in the world, specifically in the city of Eads. Uh, but throughout the world, um, echoes of these dreams were also being felt by mortals uh, throughout the world. Um, so that can kind of kick off the infectious madness, and then it can be further fueled by the unruly earth um, 
shadow event. Now, the unruly Earth shadow event basically is that the Earth is starting to rebel. As different things happen, um, earthquakes and uh, type, uh, tsunamis and, um, you know, just wild weather events. So the, the Earth is just kind of, um, you know, rebelling against uh, every, every living thing on it, and nobody knows why. Well, it turns out that the genies that are still in the world that have gone kind of, you know, cuckoo, um, they were affected by the dreams of the dead god as well. And so this, uh, that event kind of sparked them to start uh, rebelling and they control the elements. So that's why there's earthquakes. That's why there are tsunamis and stuff like that. And so... Uh, there's a, uh, a particularly a group of particularly powerful genies that um, are also causing this problem and perpetuating the infectious madness because the genies are essentially uh, driven insane, have, have been essentially driven insane by, um, by the fact that they had to merge their essence. Uh, they either had to merge their essence with the shield that separates the world from or the universe from the void or... They had to merge the essence with um, elements in the world. Either way, it kind of drove them insane. And so now that this uh, dreams, now that the dream of the dead god kind of uh, kicked things off, the uh, the madness is starting to spread. The madness that the genies feel is starting to spread. Okay, so that is the Queen of Gold, Infectious Madness, Ruly Earth. Unruly Earth is the uh, shadow or the shadow events uh, for that. So the next one I want to do is Tales of the Demon Lord 2, and I want to do that with Weird Magic. Now, what, I, what I'd really like to uh, do with Weird Magic is play with the magic system. Now, I've, I've been kind of playing with the magic system already. Uh, in fact, I um, in, kind of late in the last campaign, I kind of introduced the... Um, uh, the supplement that I purchased uh, a couple years back, I believe, and it was the Catastrophic Magic supplement for this game. And um, the uh, I gave one of my players the option of using that uh, supplement. So I kind of introduced it a little bit then, but I want to replace the current um, magic system, which is pretty stable, with something that is much less stable. Uh, reflecting the fact that magic is also starting to uh, be affected by the shadow events. So weird magic is going to be a thing. Um, so it's going to not only affect the magic system of the world, but it also has uh, its own effects that are documented in the uh, Hunger in the Void and also the Core Rulebook. So it talks about the um, magic being enhanced, uh, magical mishaps and corrupting magic as um, side effects of the weird magic. And so I'm going to uh, really be playing with the magic system throughout the Tales of the Demon Lord 2 um, to really get the, um, uh, you know, the world uh, kind of on edge as we progress towards uh, the inevitable uh, end of the world. So um, the next campaign I have in mind is Rage Against the Machines. This was um, this was a concept that was brought up in the Mother of Monsters campaign that I ran, in which uh, when the characters visited the city of wonders, uh, that's the city of the uh, city uh, of Lidge in the Confederacy of Nine Cities, um, there was a subplot where there there was like a uh, resistance or a, a rebellion starting to form among the clockworks who are still being treated as objects and, and as uh, property uh, by these, uh, by the uh, people in power in the city of Lidge. And then there, there are people that are trying to free uh, the, uh, the clockworks to be, you know, sentient free beings with equal rights uh, as the organic people of the world. And so that was a sub subplot that was started in the Mother of Monsters. Didn't really touch on it in the Dreams of the Dead, Dead God. Probably won't touch on it much in Queen of Gold. Maybe mention it uh, here and there just to keep it in, fresh 
in the players' minds, but then I really want to tackle it um, in the um, Rage Against the Machine uh, campaign and tie that into the Invaders Shadow event. So I would like to somehow have um, the Reen be the stars of the show for that campaign. Um, they are, you know, kind of, um, well, they're preparing for an invasion. And so this, along with the, um, the mother of all machines, uh, the cog God, uh, the machine God, whatever you want to call it, um, that the clockworks are, are venerating, um, is actually going to be an aspect of the Reen's um, queen. And so the Reen queen, say that a few times fast, the Reen queen is going to be the big boss of that. And uh, so she's off world somewhere um, with a uh, with the, the bulk of the Reen uh, empire and they're planning on invading. So that's going to be a thing. Um, my next campaign is going to be featuring the um, featuring hell, basically. And so there's a whole wonderful supplement that I covered before that was um, Exquisite Agony, this thing. And it features hell and it features all these devils that have all these um, um, all these plots. And there's a uh, subplot that uh, Diabolus is kind of missing in action, um, not really involved in what's going on in hell. So um, I plan on having a campaign where all the uh, Dukes of Hell um, basically start, um, you know, doing their own thing. And the PCs get caught up in that. So I want to do this whole hell campaign. I just don't know what um, shadow event I'm going to have. I may have to make one up. Because uh, the other shadow events in the book really don't really don't have what I'm looking for as far as a um, a shadow event that matches the theme of that campaign. All right, and then the, another campaign I have in mind is Grimdark's Fairy Tales, which basically takes a really close look at the the fae and the fairies of the uh, campaign world, and puts a not only a spotlight on them but also uh, gets them moving and acting um, to in uh, response to all these shadow events that are happening. And so each adventure of this campaign is going to feature a different um, fey lord, like, um, you know, the, um, the Horned King, um, Father Winter, um, Mother, uh, the World Mother, and so forth. And so there's going to be actually several different shadow events uh, um, kind of mini shadow events that will be occurring throughout this campaign. Not exactly sure how that's going to work yet. Just kind of an idea uh, at this point, but um, I kind of like it, so I'm going to see if I can work it out. And then I want to eventually have the return of the Witch King. Now, I've kind of been holding off on this one simply because I want... Um, you know, I don't want to do all the work. I want Robert Schwab to do the work for me. He's already said that he's got a, uh, an adventure in mind uh, for the return of the Witch King. Uh, he just hasn't um, written it yet. And so I'm kind of hoping that when he does his kickoff for, or his Kickstarter for the uh, Weird Wizard, uh, that one of the, uh, I hope that one of the, um, you know, one of the, um, uh, what do they call it? Uh, stretch goals. One of the stretch goals for it will be the adventure return of the Witch King. Um, it was for occult philosophy, but we didn't get that far in the campaign to unlock that particular one. So I'm kind of hoping that he's already got, you know, the idea.